Hello chess fans, this is Rick from Chess to Impress with coverage of round 8 of Tata Steel 2021. A very long tournament, still 6 rounds to go. Let's look at the standings after 7 rounds. We had 4 leaders, Giri, Van Forest, Karana and Ferruja, all with 4.5 points out of 7 games. 4 players with plus 1, Hari Krishna, Jesse Penko, Carlsen and Grandelius. Wojtasek on minus one and four players with two and a half points Vasile Graaf, Tari, Duda and Anton Gijaro. Alexander Donchenko is at the bottom of the table with two points out of seven games. Round eight saw Vasile Graaf against Van Forest, Donchenko, Tari, Duda, Anton Gijaro, Harry Krishna, Feruja, Jesse Penko against Carlsen, Grandelius against Wojtasek and Karana against Giri. In this video we're going to look at the game between Jesse Penko and Carlsen. We all know the world champion. And a few facts on Jesse Penko from his Wikipedia page. He won the European Under 10 Championship in 2012 and both the European Under 16 and World Under 16 Championship in 2017. He learned to play chess when he was 5 years old, his father taught him. And he's 18 years old now, will be 19 in March. And this is how to pronounce his name correctly, Andrei Yevgenievich Yesipenko. Or let's ask a Russian person how to pronounce it. Andrei Yevgenievich Yesipenko. That is not easy. Here we see both players at the board, Yesipenko on the left and Carlsen on the right. And the world champion was wearing his face mask in the opening of the game. Yesipenko opened with the e-pawn and Carlsen played the Sicilian. And we'll see the Nidor variation on the board which is quite popular in this tournament. Bishop e2 is a calm enough variation, but this game doesn't stay calm for very long. e5 is the main move here, but e6 was played by Carlsen, the Scheveningen setup. Bishop e3, Bishop e7, and here castling is the main move. But look at this move from Jesse Penko, g4. b5 and g5, as Jesse Penko said after the game, this is the most aggressive way to play for white. Attacking the knight, the knight dropped back to d7, a3, and that gives up on this pawn. That pawn is now attacked twice by bishop and queen and only defended by the bishop. And Carlsen decides to take the pawn. Queen d2 and the bishops go off the board. Now that the dark squared bishops are no longer on the board, black's pawn on d6 may become a weakness. And look at this move from Carlsen, queen d8 to h4, a new move, this had not been played before. And one of the ideas is that it stops white's queen to go to g3 with a double attack on two unprotected pawns. And another idea is for black to play g7, g5 himself. Rook g1 to stop that g7, g5 idea, g6 to save that pawn, and Yesipenko castled queenside. Carlsen hurried back with the queen to e7 and f4. Bishop b7 developing, king b1 and now the world champion misses a tactic. He played knight b8 to c6 here and that move deserves a question mark. Yesipenko calculated all the variations and found this move. Knight c3 takes b5 and as Peter Leko in the Chess24 broadcast put it, Magnus Carlsen's heart stopped here. At least his heart must have missed a beat. Then Leko went on to say that Carlsen fell off his chair. Anyway, it was a big blow indeed to the world champion. And let's see why nice knight c takes b5 is such a strong move. Carlsen took the knight and then knight takes c6. Bishop takes c6, you have to regain the piece. And now black has two loose pieces, the bishop on c6 and the rook on h8. And white can attack them both at the same time with the move queen e3 to c3. A double attack winning back the piece. And from the pictures on the live broadcast this move really came as a shock to the world champion. Well maybe not at this moment but at the moment that Yesipenko took knight c takes b5. Carlsen thought for a long time, decided to castle, at least get his king safe and there goes that bishop off the board. Yesipenko has the pawn back, the pawn he sacrificed on g5 and is threatening to win another one as both b5 and d6 are hanging. 
Carlson decides to give up on the, on the D-pawn and to get compensation by activating his pieces. He played d5, e takes d5, and he attacked the queen with rook f to c8. d6 from Yesipenko, counter-attacking black's queen. Carlson does not want to swap the queens, he's looking for attacking chances against white's king. So he dodges the queen swap with queen d8. The drawback is that this queen is now not on an active square. And should you take that pawn on b5? In the live broadcast, Grandmaster Robert has did not think so. But at the board, Grandmaster Andrei Yesipenko took the pawn. Rook c2 b8, hitting the queen. And these rooks have now open lines against white's king. Queen d3 seems to make sense to cover the a3 pawn. But Yesipenko plays a very strong one. He plays queen c4, giving up on the a pawn. And Carlsen took it. He cannot recapture because the b pawn is pinned. So Carlsen has one of the pawns that he was down back now. He's only one pawn down. But that's a very strong pawn on d6. Queen c7 was Yesipenko's move, offering a queen trade once again. And if you play queen f6, which is not the move that Carlson played, it looks like a strong move. It's threatening checkmate on b2, this way. But then there is queen takes b8 check, a very nice queen sacrifice from white. This is the best way to play, because after knight takes b8, the rook on a3 is hanging. b takes a3, followed by the rook lift, rook g1, g3 to b3. And the bishop from e2 goes to b5 and black will not be able to successfully block the d pawn. This pawn will prove to be too strong. So after queen c7, Carlson saw this and did not play queen f6. He played queen e8, again dodging the queen swap, but his queen is now really passive on e8. And Yesipenko keeps making great moves. Rook g5. The threat is now bishop b5 with a devastating pin of the knight. Carlsen plays rook a4. Quite an amazing move from Carlsen. He's trying to muddy the waters and trying to look for counter chances. What does rook a4 do? Why is that a good move? Well, if you continue with bishop b5, which seems to be very logical, you plan that move anyway, and it's now also attacking the rook on a4. Well, then there is this move. Rook takes b5, an exchange sacrifice. Because after rook takes b5, there is suddenly queen a8. And the tables have turned. Don't think you can take this knight, because there is a checkmate on a1. And if you don't blunder that checkmate, but play king c1, then there is rook a1 check anyway. King d2 and queen g2 check and suddenly black's queen and rook are so active it wins the rook on d1 and black is better here. So all that after rook a4 and then a logical looking move bishop b5 that white had planned. What a trick from the world champion to bring into position. But Yesipenko saw it and did not fall for it. He played rook a5. Trying to get those rooks off the board. That would diminish black's counter chances. Carlsen does not want to swap. Played rook a to b4. Threatening to take on b2. So b3 was played. And rook 4 to b7. Attacking the queen. Queen c3. White has consolidated his position. Dealt with black's counterplay. White's king is now quite safe, and white is not just a pawn up, but it is a very strong pawn. A devastating pawn, as international master Tanya Sajdev called it. Black's queen is passive, his rooks are passive, his knight cannot be activated, black is in big trouble. It looks hopeless for black, said Grandmaster Peter Leko in the Chess24 broadcast. But it is Magnus Carlsen behind the black pieces. What else can he do to make it as difficult for his opponent as possible? He played queen d8 to be able to activate the queen on that d8 h4 diagonal. Bishop f3 from Yesipenko. Rook b4. Queen c7. And again, black does not want to swap queens. That is hopeless. So queen f6. 
Black is hoping for counterplay against the pawn on b3 by sacrificing the rook. That would break down the defenses around white's king and that's why you cannot take the knight here. That would again be a blunder because of that move. Rook takes b3 check, c takes, rook takes check and it will be checkmate. King c2, queen c3 is checkmate. If you go to a2 then queen b2 is checkmate. So it's never too late to spoil a winning position after queen f6. Yesipenko had to be careful, don't take the knight. He played a very nice and a very instructive move. 32, rook a5 to a8. And because of the pin that guarantees a swap of a pair of rooks, which diminishes black's attacking chances. Carlsen had no choice, he had to swap the rook. Bishop takes and queen f5. And now the threat is to take on b3 with the rook. The c-pawn cannot take back because of the pin. So again you cannot take the knight because of rook takes b3 check. King c1 and queen takes f4 check and black is winning here. So what to do after queen f5? The quickest win as the engine points out is queen c8 check. But Yesipenko played a very sensible move. King b2 on pinning the c-pawn. If you play queen f6 check then there is king a3 and the king is very safe there. In the game Carlsen tried rook b5. With the idea rook c5 to put pressure against a c2 pawn. Yesipenko calculated everything and thought that he could now safely take the knight. And he was right because after rook c5 there was rook c1 defending the c pawn. Queen takes f4 and as Peter Leko explained, white always has a defense against checks on the long diagonal by playing c2, c3 followed by rook to c2 and the white king is completely safe and the game is over with white's extra material. After queen takes f4, Yesipenko gave a check, king g7 and he pushed the pawn. He's threatening to make a new queen and Carlsen thought for a few minutes and then resigned the game. After queen d4 check, there is c3 as said, queen d2 check, rook c2, and there's nothing more to play here for black. 18 year old Andrei Yevgenevich Yesipenko had beaten the world champion in 38 moves, the biggest day of his life. And when he was asked in his interview after the game, how will you spend your rest day tomorrow? He gave the immortal answer, I think I will go to the supermarket. And what about Carlsen? Well, he tweeted after the game. Quite a nice self-deprecating tweet. Had a very unpleasant experience at the playing hall today. Felt like a swab was being shoved into my nostril and all the way inside my brain, causing a lot of pain. Covid test after the game was not that bad though. So the world champion took it in good spirits, although inside he must be very disappointed with how his tournament has gone so far. A win in round one, then six draws and then this loss against the youngster from Russia. The results of round eight. We saw draws in Vasheda Graf van Forest, Donchenko Tari, Duda against Anton Guijaro and Ali Reza Feruja won again. After his loss in the first round against Carlsen he has won four games. Quite amazing, this time he beat Harry Krishna with black. We saw the shock, Jesipenko against Carlsen. And the two last games, Grandelius Wojtasek and Karuana Giri were also drawn. That leads to these standings after eight rounds. Alireza Ferruja is leading the 2021 Tata Steel Tournament with five and a half points out of eight games. Followed by four players half a point behind, Van Forest, Karuana, Giri and Jesse Penko. Grandelius is on four and a half and Harry Krishna and Carlsen are on 50%. Wojtasek is half a point behind them and four players on three points. Vasile Graf, Tari, Duda and Anton Guijaro. Alexander Donchenko is on two and a half points. He made five draws so far in this event. Monday the 25th of January will be a rest day and round nine will be played on Tuesday the 26th of January. And we'll see this lineup. Giri against Vasile Graf, Wojtasek against Kaurana. Carlsen Grandelius, Feruja, Jesse Penko, the battle of the youngsters. It looks like the tie of the round. Anton Guijaro against Harry Krishna, Tari Duda and Van Forest against Donchenko. I will be here after the round to tell you what happened. 
I hope you enjoyed this video and that if you did that you'll give it a thumbs up, that you'll subscribe to the Chess to Impress channel and that you'll leave a comment. I will read them all and I will reply to them all. If you liked the video it would be great if you could share it on social media by clicking the share button on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram, on Twitter and on Facebook. This is Rick for Chess to Impress. Thank you for watching.